So as some of you have noticed, we are going to be using Canvas this quarter instead of Moodle. Um, the university is completely switching over to Canvas by spring quarter anyway, so I figured why the hell not learn something new now. Um, so this will be an experience for all of us. I'm going to pre-apologize for it probably sucking. Thus far, though, I, uh, I like how easy it is to use Canvas and all that kind of stuff. And I also like that I can explicitly set it up to see what you guys see to make sure things don't look too ridiculous. Um, so at this point, um, I already have, let me go to the student view so we can see what you guys can see. Um, I believe I have already have all of the different sections and all of that kind of stuff set up, including where I'm going to put your exam dates and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, I'm going to have the homeworks kind of embedded with the class meetings that they're associated with um, instead of having a completely different section because I don't have the navigation or access to change the navigation thing on the left-hand side like I did on Moodle. So this way uh, makes a little bit more sense organizationally. Um, we'll talk about the homeworks in a little bit, but for example, this homework set number one, this is actually covering the material that we're going to cover today, as well as the material that we're going to cover on Friday, and so it would be due Wednesday, so the same kind of thing. Uh, it's going to be due to two class meetings after we finish covering the material. Uh, it was a sign so that there's plenty of time and all that kind of stuff for you guys to do it. Um, same basic format, um, PDF submissions. Actually, let me look at this thing. So I want to show you guys something. Uh, one thing that I want to notice or want you guys to notice is that we're using the exact same naming convention as we used last quarter. Um, you guys got a quarter's worth of being yelled at by the graders. Um, so there's literally no reason whatsoever for you guys to start screwing stuff up now. So there is no grace period at all. Do it correctly <laughs> or take a zero. All right. Um, it is set up for three attempts. Oh, I thought I, yeah, okay. So it is set up for three attempts. Um, the reason why it's set up for three attempts is that I may allow you, um, like I'm going to ask the graders to start penalizing from the jump. If they are nice, they might ask you to resubmit to get points back, and this is how you'll do that. So it's just facilitating their possibility of asking you to resubmit without me having to figure out how the hell I'm supposed to do it on Canvas. This is how I'm choosing to do it on Canvas. So realistically, you should only just need the one attempt and all that kind of good stuff. Um, all right, anyway, so just wanted to show you how that interface works because you guys are going to be dealing with that 10 plus times this quarter. Let me go back to the home thing. Um, let's see. Um, I've just provided the same homework formatting example as I did last quarter because it's literally the exact same thing. doesn't matter what class it is, do it that way or you're going to piss me off. Um, let's look at the syllabus here. Some of you have already figured out I have a Zoom set up as per usual. And let me make this slightly larger so that we can see stuff. I'm going to go through this really quickly because we've seen all this crap before. Um, you know who I am. You know where my office is. My office hours are literally the exact same as last quarter. Um, I just find and replaced everywhere that used to say Moodle and replaced it with Canvas. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to say Moodle at numerous points. I mean Canvas, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in this class, we're going to look at effectively nonlinear circuits, right? So everything that we've done up to this point has been dealing with the fact that we have linear circuit elements like resistors, capacitors, and inductors, where everything is proportional and nice and pretty. And now we're going to be dealing with diodes and transistors where nothing is proportional. And so we have to do special things to make things look linear in certain instances and just deal with nonlinearity in other instances and we'll talk about all that kind of good stuff as we get into it. Um, the official textbook for the class is Microelectronic Circuits 8th edition by um, Cedra and Smith and then two other guys that just kind of got tagged on here recently. Um, I think it is a quite good book. Um, that being said, I don't think you actually need to buy it because I record everything and post all my crap online. Um, I don't know of a free textbook like I know for linear circuit analysis, so 
if you are actually going to purchase a textbook on this material, this wouldn't be a bad one to buy. Um, let's see, disability disclosure, same thing as normal. I've already gotten a couple of TDS requests and all that kind of jazz, so that's good. Um, attendance policy, usual thing, you're adults, do what you're going to do. Um, be less of a jerk than I am, don't cheat. Uh, homework, uh, I, I missed this, I say it's due 5 p.m., it's going to be due at midnight. Um, all that kind of good stuff. I'll probably go back and fix that. Uh, let's see. Um, this class is very difficult. I, I'm being genuine here. Um, you probably have heard horror stories about this class. Some of them are unfounded and many of them are not. Okay. Uh, this class is difficult enough such that um, I actually offer it over the summer in an accelerated thing. So um, electronic circuits one in the first six week session, electronic circuits two in the second six week, six week session over the summer because enough students legitimately fail this class that they need to have a summer offering to be able to be caught back up and take senior design um, in the fall. So consider yourself forewarned. I'm gonna make this material as accessible as I possibly can, but it is going to kick several of your asses significantly. It is not easy stuff. Okay. Um, because it is not easy stuff and it's very easy to fall behind, I reserve the right to be a dickhead and give you pop quizzes to keep you on your toes and to make sure that you are keeping up with stuff. Okay. So these are unplanned things. I may not do any. I may have a day where I see, oh, uh, let's say it's the Monday before Christmas break, which by the way, we're supposed to all be here taking classes. And there are six of you here. Guess what? There's definitely going to be a quiz. I'll make one up on the spot to get your asses in the seats when you're supposed to be here. I just want to be really clear about that. Okay, good. So anyway, um, reserve the right to, to, to do quizzes. Uh, there are going to be design projects in this class. Um, they're not going to be individual design projects this time. They're going to be group design projects, two to three students. Um, I'm not expecting like a huge full-blown 15-page report or anything like that, um, but five to 10 pages would be reasonable. So it's a little bit further along than what you guys have done in my previous classes where you had to do design work. It's not just simply, let's throw a little bit of math at this and make sure it works. It's going to require some some thought, making some assumptions and all of that kind of good stuff. Uh, and the simulations are gonna be a little bit more difficult as well because you don't have simple circuit elements to deal with anymore. You're dealing with diodes uh, and transistors and all that kind of jazz. Um, three exams, as per usual, there will be an in-class portion and a take-home portion. Um, in previous years, I put theoretical questions on the in-class portions and then would just get wildly frustrated at how shitty your answers were. So all of the theoretical questions are now going to be delegated to the take-home portion, which means I am expecting not essays, but paragraphs of information, under, making sure that you understand how these things work and all of that kind of good stuff. No one to two sentences of surface level knowledge that will not be sufficient. So I'm just telling you that now. Um, during the in-class portion, as per usual, only FE approved calculators can be used for the take-home portion. I'm expecting you to have to use your computer um, for various things. Um, let's see waiting and all that kind of stuff. So homework and quizzes total will be 25%. Um, and that's the distribution between homework and quizzes is going to change depending on how many quizzes I feel like I have to give you guys and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I don't know why I keep looking at you when I say this. It's not <laughs> uh, design projects, there are going to be three design projects. Each will be worth uh, 5%. Um, Normally, like in previous syllabi and all that kind of stuff, when I mentioned design projects, I said, you know, if you fail to do a design project, you fail the class or whatever, because these are group design projects. I don't want to tie anyone's failing the class to somebody else's lack of work. Uh, so I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to grade these pretty harshly. So I'm just letting you know up front. Um, three exams, 25% each. 
Um, and then the weight of the exam on which you receive the lowest score will be reduced to 15%. If you do the math there, that actually adds up to 105%, which means there is 5% bonus built into this class, again, because it's going to kick your asses. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, general, don't curve, don't all the round stuff. Uh, syllabus changes, don't expect anything to change. Emergency notification system, sign up, it's the winter, weather events happen, COVID policy, don't show up to school if you're sick. Uh, if you get me sick, I'm going to be super pissed off. <laughs> um, counseling services, if I'm being too much of an asshole, uh, you can go here. <laughs> um, AI tools, policy, and all that kind of stuff, um, there is a distinct possibility that you guys might choose to use jet, uh, chat GPT or something like that to help you with writing your reports or figuring things out for your design projects and all of that kind of good stuff. Um, so I have my permitted uses and prohibited uses detailed here so that you know what you are allowed to and what you are not allowed to do with AI in this class. Um, if you use it for anything, cite it. And then we have our tentative course schedule um, first exam will be the Friday after we get back from the Christmas holiday. Um, it will cover only the material from today up through effectively right before we leave for Christmas break. Uh, introduction to BJTs will be the first material for exam two. Uh, so I'm trying to give you guys a little bit of time to remove your heads from your asses after the Christmas break and remember how things work before you go into exam. Um, I've organized this class maybe a little oddly, but it makes sense to me. Uh, the first module for the class is all about PN junction and diode circuits. The second module of the class is all about large signal transistor circuits. Um, so we're going to talk about how the different types of transistor technologies work, the physics behind them. You, know, you guys just love semiconductor physics so much. Um, we're going to focus primarily on NPN and N-channel devices, and then we're going to dedicate one day each to BMP and P-channel, respectively, because those are used less, but still used. Um, and then our third module is all about using transistors as um, small signal amplifiers. Yes. So will the, will the third exam be non-tuner? Correct. So the third exam is just on amplifiers. The second exam is just on large signal transistor circuits. The first exam is just on PN junctions slash diodes and their applications. Yeah, so non-cumulative exam. Um, the last exam is... Friday the 22nd, and I couldn't think of anything to do on the Monday, so unless you guys give me a reason to have class, I don't intend on doing it. So. Um, any questions regarding the syllabus, et cetera? All right, so today we're going to be talking about um, a review of semiconductor physics. will be pretty basic. Um, so let's start with semiconductor basics. All right. So conveniently enough, there is a large periodic table in this room. Um, so if you look at column 14 of said periodic table over here. That is where our elementary semiconductors lie, right? Um, so we have single element semiconductors. These are also called elemental semiconductors. Um, this is column C O L fourteen of the periodic table. So that 
influence things like um, carbon. Typically, carbon as a semiconductor is either in the form of carbon nanotubes uh, or graphene, which is a two-dimensional crystal in structure. Um, we have silicon, SI, uh, the most commonly used semiconductor material in modern times um, because effectively it's sand. There's lots and lots of it, um, although we are running out. And then germanium is another one. Um, still in use in some applications, but was used extensively um, prior to people figuring out how to process silicon um, to make electronics grade silicon, which is 99.9999999% pure. Um, so in this class, we are going to focus largely on silicon, but not only on silicon. We have, we'll deal with some other things as well. Um, we also have compound semiconductors. So these are made of multiple elements. So some examples of binary semiconductors. Um, this would be so multiple group four materials. So this would be silicon carbide um, or silicon germanium. We also have some that are made from group three and five materials. So that would be gallium nitride, uh, GAN, uh, used a lot by the United States Air Force in the development of high temperature um, sensors. I don't think that's violating any MDAs. Um, indium antimonide, so that would be INSB would be an example. And then we might also have things like a uh, group 26. Sorry, that should be VI. Semiconductors like zinc selenide and, and cadmium sulfide and things like that. All of these different semiconductors have different properties, meaning that they get used for different applications and all of that kind of good stuff. All of these compound semiconductors that I have listed are what are called binary semiconductors in as much as they only have two semiconductor materials, uh, but there are also tertiary and quaternary semiconductor materials that are usually um, ceramic in nature, um, and they have crazy different chemical compounds trying to get specific characteristics and all of that kind of good stuff. So you can have like 30 different semiconductor materials that all have the same elements, but the ratios are different, all that kind of jazz, just trying to do certain things. Okay. So these are the different semiconductors that we might see in this class. Um, what separates semiconductors from other materials like conductors and insulators? You guys have had classes on this. Tell me what you know. They can be both at different uh, setups. So conduct electricity and also kind of block. Okay. So their electrical characteristics are somewhere in between that of an insulator and that of a conductor, right? Um, where can we see this the most? Obviously. Did you guys deal with energy band diagrams? In... Okay, so let's look at energy band diagrams really quickly for different materials, right? So over here on the left, let's look at the energy band diagram for an insulator, okay? So this is electron energy measured in electron volts. The top of this region is going to be the conduction band energy plus 
chi, where chi is the electron affinity. Uh, and so this represents an energy level high enough to literally strip the electron from the atom and release it into free space. This band level right here is the collection band, excuse me, the conduction band energy. And then we typically have a very large gap Below this, we have our valence band. And then down here at the bottom is our zero or right? So in an insulator, typically speaking, the energy state, state of the valence band are completely filled and the energy states in the conduction band are completely empty, and the energy band gap is so large such that it takes an incredible amount of energy in order to move a charge carrier from the valence band into the conduction band, which is why it conducts energy so poorly, because there are so few charge carriers available for conduction. It's not impossible, it just takes a whole hell of a lot of energy to strip um, the charge carriers from the valence band and push them into the conduction band. Now, in contrast, we might have a metal. So in a metal, similar graph set up here, right? This is electron energy measured in electron volts. This level right here is the top of the conduction band plus the electron affinity chi. Down here is the edge of our conduction band. And then up here might be the top edge of our valence band. And down here would be our reference level of zero. There's no energy band gap to speak of. In fact, our conduction band and our valence band slightly overlap. Since our valence band is usually filled, we have a material in which there are charge carriers that are ready to conduct because they are already in the conduction band at a neutral and kind of unenergized state, right? It takes no effort whatsoever to allow conduction in a material like this because there's this region of space here in the conduction band which is extending from here to here where there are already charge carriers available to be moved around due to either drift or diffusion okay. and then somewhere between those two things we have our semiconductor materials So here's EC plus chi. Here's EC. Now we have a very small energy band gap. And so while it does take some effort to move a charge carrier from the valence band into the conduction band, it's not nearly as much as we would see in an insulating material. So we have effectively electrical properties that are somewhere in between that of an insulator and that of a conductor or metal. All right, so what energy band gaps are we likely to see? So for silicon, and this will be provided to you in tables in your homework assignments and all of that kind of stuff. Um, actually, let me put this. 
for silicon, our energy band gap is, I believe, 1.12 electron volts for germanium. I may be misremembering here. Um, I believe it's 0 0.66 electron volts. And for gallium arsenide, and again, I'll give you the actual numbers in a table just in case I'm misremembering things. Uh, the band gap is, I think, on the order of 1.3 or 1.4 electron volts. For an insulator, it's usually closer to 8 to 10 electron volts, so almost an entire order of magnitude greater um, band gap size, which means it's that much harder in order to move charge carriers from the valence band into the conduction band. All right, so when I talk about the differences between the different types of materials, this is usually what I'm going to reference, band gap things, with it, right? Something that we can observe and measure and all that kind of jazz. All right, so moving on from here. Most semiconductor materials, not all, but most, are crystalline in structure. So they are highly ordered. Um, we're not going to talk a whole heck of a lot about crystal defects and all that kind of stuff in, in this class. Um, we'll maybe talk about it very briefly when we we'll talk about doping and all that kind of stuff here in a little bit. Um, if we are looking at a silicon crystal in structure, what, what does that look like? Do you guys know? Diamond crystal lattice or zinc blend crystal lattice. So it's effectively two FCC or K-centered cubic crystal lattices that are interposed on top of each other, right? Where um, I think it's one fourth of an atomic distance a away. So if we were to look at a planar representation of things, um, we might see something like this, right? So this guy right here represents the nuclei of a silicon atom. This is another nucleus. So on and so forth. And let's say that this is at a temperature of zero degrees Kelvin, so absolute zero, right? We would see that all of these silicon atoms form covalent bonds, right? If we look at our periodic table, we should be able to pretty easily see that silicon is going to have four electrons in its valence band. And each of those electrons is going to be shared by a neighbor such that we have a nice, neat structure like this, where pretty much everything is electrically neutral and there are no free charge carriers to deal with, right? So let me um, annotate this really quickly. So these guys right here are covalent bonds, meaning that electrons are shared between these two elements. And this guy right here is a silicon nucleus. What would our band gap structure, our energy band structure, look like for this particular situation, right? So here, 
there's PC plus chi. CC, EV, and zero. We have a gap of 1.12 electron volt between the edge of the valence band and the edge of the conduction band. And because we're at T is equal to zero K and none of our electrons have any thermal energy to speak of, our valence band is completely filled and our conduction band is completely empty. Halfway between these two things, we have our Fermi energy level, um, which just represents the point at which there's a 50% probability of binding an electron. Right? So our Fermi energy level for the semiconductor actually occurs in the band gap where there isn't a stable energy level for an electron to assume. So, what's going to happen as the temperature increases, right? So as the temperature increases, uh, let me redraw some things here. Let me do, move this guy over. At some point, I'm going to make PowerPoints for this. Today is not that day. So all this is going on at T, excuse me, capital T is greater than zero degrees Kelvin. And as our temperature increases, we start to see that our silicon atoms have thermal energy, right? So their lattice is effectively going to start vibrating. And every now and then, our lattice vibration magnitude will be large enough such that one of our covalent bonds is going to break. And when that covalent bond breaks, we have an electron, which I'm going to do in blue, is going to get released. And if an electron gets released by a covalent bond, an associated hole also exists. You might also hear it as a vacancy. It's simply the lack of an electron, right? So if an electron jumps out of that bond, there's the place where the electron is supposed to be, and that is an artificial positive charge carrier because there isn't an electron there making that bond neutral. Okay. So our energy band structure for this case is going to look something like this. Here's EV, here's zero. And this thing is going to be mostly filled. But we're going to have vacancy in the valence band and an electron 
let me draw that arrow a little bit longer. Somewhere up here in the conduction band, and it's going to be able to move over time into the lowest available energies, right? So how far up it goes inside the conduction band is dependent upon how much thermal energy was imparted to it. Um, but over time, it will fall into the lowest available energy state, right? Um, so the presence of this electron in the conduction band and this hole in the valence band has now made our crystalline structure very slightly conducting because we have two charge carriers that are available for conduction, right? Um, as temperature increases, the probability of covalent bonds breaking increases, which means as the temperature goes up and up and up, we're going to have more and more of these events where we are generating an electron hole pair, right? So it's always going to come in pairs. Um, when an electron in the conduction band and a hole in the valence band effectively meet, they are going to annihilate each other in a process called recombination. Okay. So let me write that down. So when a wandering electron in the conduction band meets a hole in the valence band, the electron may release energy to drop back down into the valence band annihilating the electron hole pair in a process called The combination. The rate at which recombination occurs is dependent on the number of electron hole pairs that we have, right? So the more electron hole pairs there are in the conduction and valence bands, respectively, um, the more likely that they will be able to find an oppositely charged carrier to recombine. It. And since the number of electron hole pairs that are generated is dependent upon temperature, that means the recombination rate is also dependent on temperature, right? So at a certain point, our crystalline structure is going to reach what's called thermal equilibrium. So at thermal equilibrium, The thermal generation rate of electron hole pairs is equal to the recombination rate. of electron hole pairs. And the electron concentration and hole concentrations are 
are equal. So mathematically, we are going to describe this as N, which is our electron concentration, measured in per cubic centimeters, will be equal to P, which is our whole concentration, also measured in per cubic centimeters. And this will be equal to Ni, which is what's called the intrinsic carrier concentration. Once again, measured in per cubic centimeters. Uh, we can also express this relationship in a slightly different form. The product of N, the electron concentration, times P, the whole concentration, must be equal to Ni squared. And this is what's more commonly known as the mass action mass. So the intrinsic carrier concentration must be temperature dependent because the generation of electron hole pairs depends on temperature, right? So mathematically, Ni is given by B times temperature to the three halves power times the exponential of negative our band gap, I wrote Q instead of a G, divided by twice ABT. So this guy B right here is commonly referred to in textbooks as a material dependent parameter. Um, but you, yes, three halves. So it doesn't really have a name as it's described in most electrical engineering textbooks. However, if you were to look at a solid state physics textbook, um, this would be related to the effective density of states in the conduction band multiplied by the effective density of states in the valence band, and then you take the square root of that product. Did you guys talk about effective density of states at all in 334? Okay. So you know that that has to deal with the effective mass of electrons and effective mass of holes, which are also temperature dependent and all of that kind of good stuff. So all of that crazy quantum physics for our intents and purposes is boiled down to a number. So we understand where it comes from. We no longer care about that because we're engineers, not physicists. It's B. Uh, T is temperature measured in Kelvin. Um, by the way, this thing has units of Kelvin to the negative three halves power times centimeter to the negative three. Um, let's see, EG is our band gap, which we've already talked about, measured in electron volts. Um, KB is... Boltzmann's constant. I'm trying to remember. I think it's two n's. Um, where this is equal to one point three 
eight zero six five. That five looks particularly shitty. Give me a moment. Times ten to the negative twenty three joules per Kelvin. Or eight point six one seven three three times 10 to the negative five electron volts per Kelvin. These numbers are literally identical. They're just expressed in different units. Um, I personally prefer this representation. That being said, I see students make mistakes using it very regularly because they do not understand what the unit of an electron volt actually represents. All right, so let's talk about that as a quick aside. What does one electron volt mean? The charge of one electron multiplied by one volt. That's literally it. So what's the charge of an electron? 1.602 blah, blah, blah times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. We usually call this U times one volt, where a volt is just a joule or coulomb. And so we can see very easily that the coulombs cancel each other out. So an electron volt is just a industry-wide notation for energy. It's used in semiconductor physics. Okay? So anytime we're dealing with electron volts, we're just dealing with energy. <laughs> represented not in joules because joules aren't convenient. We'll get these weird numbers with huge exponents. We just want to say, oh, no, it's like 5 EV, something like that. It was a little easier to deal with. Um, as another quick aside thing here, the quantity KVT do this in green. is approximately equal to 25.9, which we might as well just call 26 millivolts for simplicity's sake, at a temperature of 300 Kelvin. So anytime you see KBT, I don't expect you to actually calculate anything. I want you to, every time you see KBT, to say, that's 26 millivolts. Call it a damn day. Okay. This is what's commonly known that H looks terrible. As the thermal voltage, you might occasionally see this as VT but I will practically never use that. Um, the reason that I don't like to use VT for thermal voltage, and we'll usually just leave it in terms of KVT, is because we're gonna be dealing with thermal voltages and threshold voltages and feminine voltages in this class. And there's only so many ways I can write VT and VTH and have it make any damn sense whatsoever. So I will usually just leave it as KVT with the understanding that when I'm talking about thermal voltage, that's what I mean, and just call it 26 millivolts, unless we're not at a temperature of 300 degrees Kelvin, in which case you then actually need to do the math and figure out what the appropriate voltage be at that particular temperature. All right, um, I think I've ranted about the semantics of things enough right here. Hopefully you guys understand what an electron volt means, introduce the concept of the voltages and all of that kind of good stuff. So that you'll understand where numbers are coming from when I use these in equations. All right, so
let's talk about GOAT semiconductors or extrinsic semiconductor materials. So at normal operating temperatures, read that as roughly room temperature, 300 degrees Kelvin. Most semiconductor materials do not have enough free charge carriers. I don't know why I hyphenated that. To be considered good electrical conductors. So conductivity sigma is Q, the charge of a single electron, which I defined above, times our whole concentration times our whole mobility plus our electron concentration times our electron mobility. Um, so let me just put an arrow here. So these are both carrier mobilities measured in centimeters squared per volt seconds. For those of you that care about being this fish. Should be all of you at this point. So for silicon, at room temperature with intrinsic silicon, meaning no dopants whatsoever, this is about 3.023 times 10 to the negative 6 per ohms per centimeter. As a point of reference, let me write this down, silicon. This is approximately 5.952 times 10 to the positive five per ohm per centimeter for copper at 300K. So at room temperature, silicon is roughly a trillion times worse of a conductor, or has a trillion times lower conductivity than copper, right? So at room temperature, intrinsic silicon is actually a pretty garbage conductor, which is why we practically never use it intrinsically, right? Instead, we dope our semiconductor materials in order to change their electrical properties while making their mechanical properties and optical properties and things like that effectively unchanged, okay? So in order to make the semiconductor more suitable for electrical conduction,
impurities, also called dopants, are introduced. So, group three elements like boron or gallium are called acceptor dopants that only have three valence electrons. Thanks. When they are added to a semiconductor, they create excess holes beyond our intrinsic carrier concentration Ni, resulting in what's commonly called P-type e material. So, Let's talk about why this happens by looking at an energy band diagram for an extrinsic semiconductor doped with a acceptor dopant. Yep. So I'm going to draw the energy band gap on this a little larger than I have been just for clarity's sake here, but we're still only talking about roughly one electron volt worth of gap. Still dealing with the semiconductor thing, right? So this is what it would look like if we had an intrinsic semiconductor. But when we add those impurities, particularly acceptor impurities, acceptor dopants, what we're going to do is we're going to establish a new energy level called Ea. And it's going to have these sites. Like so. Okay. So these are energy levels that are inside the band gap, right? Um, This distance right here is approximately 0 0.05 electron volts. That number changes dependent on what dopant that we actually use. But that's very, very small in comparison to the band gap of the semiconductor as a whole, right? So to move a electron from the valence band up into the conduction band, it takes roughly one electron volt. Might be a little bit more, might be a little bit less, depending on what type of semiconductor we're dealing with. But moving 
and electrons in the valence bands into one of these acceptor energy states takes roughly one twentieth that amount of energy. So those donor atoms get ionized very, very easily, right? So we might have a hole here and a hole here because we can very easily move electrons from the valence band into that acceptor energy level, right? Um, for silicon, our acceptor ionization energies are for boron zero point zero four five electron volts. For aluminum, 0 0.057 electron volts. And for gallium, 0 0.072 electron volts. So regardless of what we dope with out of column 13 or group 3, depending on what type of theory we're looking at, we're still talking about a significantly smaller energy, uh, amount of energy needed in order to create those holes in the valence. Okay. So what impact is this going to have on our carrier concentrations? Okay. Well, if Na is much, much greater that our intrinsic carrier concentration, then the whole concentration in our p-type material will be approximately Na. So realistically, it's going to be Na plus Ni. But if Na is a thousand times larger, Ni isn't going to really make any appreciable difference whatsoever. Right? Um, just to be very clear here, this capital P represents the whole concentration. The lowercase p represents that we are dealing with a P-type material because it has been doped with acceptor atoms. So that's the subscript um, nomenclature that we're going to be using. Subscript of P is for P-type materials dealing with holes. The subscript of N is for N-type materials dealing with electrons. Okay. And from the mass action law, the number of electrons in our P-type material is going to be approximately Ni squared divided by N. So this is how p-type materials are formed. Um, before we talk about n-type materials and n-type tokens or um, let's talk about Na or whatever being much greater than Ni, right? So I'm going to make you guys calculate this in your first homework assignment, um, but for silicon, um, the number of intrinsic carriers at 300 degrees Kelvin is roughly 1 times 10 to the 10 uh, per cubic centimeter. Uh, I've seen in different textbooks as low as 0 0.6 times 10 to the 10 and as much as 1.5 times 10 to the 10, but it's always somewhere in the ballpark of 1 times 10 to the 10. So um, roughly 10 billion free charge carriers um, per cubic centimeter at a temperature of 300 degrees Kelvin. A lightly doped silicon semiconductor usually has a dopant concentration of somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to the 15. So that would be 100,000 times more charge carriers contributed by the dopant than there are due to the intrinsic properties 
of the semiconductor material itself. And a highly doped concentration would be somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to the 18. Okay. So 10 to the 15 dopants would be lightly doped, 10 to the 18 dopants would be very heavily doped. This seems like extremely large numbers of dopant materials, right? I mean, a billion billion would be 10 to the 18. How many silicon atoms are in a cubic centimeter of material? Five times 10 to the 22, roughly. So that means that if we dope something at a concentration of 10 to the 18 atom, dopant atoms per cubic centimeter, we are really only talking about one to 10 parts per million doping concentration for the silicon. So we vastly change the electrical properties because there are so many more free charge carriers, but all of the other properties of silicon remain effectively constant because it's only one in every million silicon atoms that have been replaced by this doping thing. If we're talking about a lightly doped crystal where we're doping at 10 to the 15, we're actually talking about parts per billion doping concentration, right? So all of these impacts are, are the impact of uh, implementing acceptor atoms and donor atoms, as we'll see in a minute, is really only going to impact the electrical properties of the material and not the physical properties whatsoever. All right, so we've talked about P-type now. We've talked about what reasonable doping concentrations are um, in industrial processes and all that kind of stuff. Now let's wrap things up here with um, N-type doping. So group five elements. Like phosphorus, arsenic, and I think that's antimony. are called donor dopants. And have five electrons, uh, five valence electrons. Let me rewrite that, sorry. when they are added to semiconductor material, they create excess electrons in the conduction band uh, beyond Ni. Resulting in go away thing, go away thing. N type material. And very quickly, I can draw the energy band structure for this. Once again, exaggerating the band gap for clarity's sake. So zero, PV, PC, PC plus chi. Up here, we're gonna have a level ED. And so remember, um, in this case, our valence band is completely filled. Here is our band gap, approximately one electron volt. Now we have our ionization gap. What color did I do it up here? Blue. This distance is approximately, once again, 0 0.05 electron volts 
And so what we're going to see is that it takes only a very small amount of energy in order to ionize these donors. So they're going to leave behind a hole in this state here in the middle of the span gap, which really doesn't do anything. Um, but they're going to leave electrons available for conduction, right? Our valence band is still completely filled. Um, our donor ionization energy is here. Our 0 0.045 for phosphorus. Zero point zero five four electron volts for arsenic and zero point zero three nine electron volts for SB, which again I believe is antimony, but I may not be remembering the name correctly. So if our dopant concentration ND or donor concentration ND is much greater than NI then we'll see that the electron concentration in our n-type crystal is approximately nd, and our hole concentration in our n-type crystal is approximately ni squared over nd. All right, that's enough out of me because I'm two minutes long and I also ran out of material for good. All right. Um, with what we covered today, you guys should be able to do homework problems one and two of the homework set number one. It's available on Canvas. Um, realistically, it shouldn't hurt anything if you decided to wait until we covered Friday's class meeting or whatever, but you could get started on things now if you were so inclined. Um, does anybody have any questions before I shut down the Zoom and all that kind of crap and go to my next class? Tosh. Great question. Let's see. Um, damn it. Hold on. Let me go back to home. So uh, it says electrical engineering 223 homework formatting example because I use the exact same homework formatting in all of my classes that have arguably paper homework. Uh, this is going to take a minute to load because if I remember correctly, yeah, 31 pages. So um, as in all of my other classes, I want the assignment sheet to be your cover page or cover pages, as the case will practically always be. Um, immediately after your cover page or pages, then I want your handwritten work for problem one. After your handwritten work for problem one, by the way, please box your answer so the graders can find it easily. Then have any math CAD related work that you might have or LT spice related work that you might have. So effectively it should go cover pages, handwritten work for problem one, computer work for problem one, handwritten work for problem two, computer work for problem two, and so on and so forth. Um, like I said, this is not the first time that any of you have had me, although it may be the first time in a, a bit you guys have had me. Um, so I'm going to tell the grader to start docking points immediately if you screw up the formatting and all of that kind of good stuff. Um, I will have them reach out to you if they will allow you to fix things and then resubmit all that kind of good stuff to get some of the points back. And I already have that thing kind of set up on the canvas point. Yes. Um, you do not need to handwrite this stuff, although I do, as you can see here. Um, I give you the assignment sheets in docx format so that you can easily copy and paste that crap into your thing. So I appreciate the effort if you do choose to handwrite it, but I'm not forcing you to do so. And if your penmanship is garbage, not looking at anybody in particular, but definitely looking at the person I'm talking to, you could just <laughs> type the whole damn thing if you wanted to. 
<laughs> Any further questions? Yeah. <laughs> All right. See you guys on Friday. Thanks.